Mr. Speaker, it may take the House a little time to come down from the altitude. Because, because I'm accustomed to the member flying in a plane, but these days I see he's flying in the rocket and he's going on a different thing, a different thing. So Mr. Speaker, first of all, um, I want to join the Prime Minister in, in celebrating and, and acknowledging um, our success at UNESCO and uh, achieving our uh, presidency of that, of that organization. But the success points to continuation, continuity. And so I think hopefully the Prime Minister and even the member from Labry would join us in also thanking um, Ambassador Shaguri, who has been our ambassador over several um, different administrations and has established um, a significant foothold in that organization, has developed an incredible rapport with all of the other countries, um, and the respect that St. Lucia has gained at UNESCO in a large part, not by himself, but in a large part, is it attributable to him, but I think for all of us, in allowing that institution to have that level of continuity, continuity. I was again saddened today, Mr. Speaker, that we're here to talk about something as important as water. And that the temptation to politicize even this little project could not be resisted by members on the opposite side. When we want to speak about this water project, and I listened very intently, and I'm hoping that the general public also listened very intently to all the reasons that were given today by many members as to how important water is. Schools, sanitary, basic standard of living that we all have come to expect and need in order to having a regular water supply of clean water. A regular water supply of clean water. The glowing, glowing reports, how important it is. And then entwined within that, this whole thing about Miku North and Miku South, that they intend to capture Miku South next election. This is the same government that in 1997 won Miku South. You should remember. One term. One term. And the reason for the one term is because the words were much louder than the deeds. This is the same government that today wants to say that they're a caring government. They care about the people in Miku North and that they hope to show the people in Miku South how much they care. But I want to remind them that this is the same government that in 2006 and 2011, the then Arson James started a water project to service the people in T. Roche, going all the way down to Duga and Lacouville. Because the persons on that side of the constituency did not have a regular supply of water. And the same things they were speaking of, the rationing of water, you had to figure out what day you were going to get water, whether tanks were sufficient and the investment that people were having to make in buying tanks, because this went on for years. And Mr. James ended up using part of his CDP resources to buy a tank and to work with WASCO. And when the government changed in 2011, for five years, that project was discontinued. Now, how does that action meet the test of what was being said in the House today? What? How? How could anybody genuinely believe the members on the other side when we don't even have to go that far back to see what was taking place. 
I'm not going to get into the emotional aspect of the suffering that took place on that side of the constituency. Because you've all articulated it better than I ever can. But it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for you. I'm embarrassed. I am. That y'all could come and say all these things and say it with the greatest amount of passion, including my good friend from Lavery. The Republic, not the country. This is the same government that when they were in office, and redid the East Coast Road. The road stopped at the Canals Bridge and re, re begun at Prale. People in the Miku have not forgotten that. And the fact is, is the, the, how idiotic the policy was. As if only the people from Miku South and Miku North used that road. As if only. It's not me inventing that. That's actually what took place and transpired. You want to speak about work that was done not forever because the work of United Workers Party in Miku North needs no explanation. That the father of our nation personally was involved in the development of that constituency. And again, I'm not going to bring back times today because it's very difficult for even young people today to relate to the extent of lack of infrastructure that we had in those constituencies. But suffice to say, roads, schools, Water, telephones, electricity didn't exist. And the transformation that was brought to those constituencies and other constituencies in the South that benefited from this vision of a United Workers' Party. But just in the last five years, construction of a new wing at the Mon Repo Passions Combined School. Construction of the new football field in Miku Village. Construction of the new Miku Health Center in Miku Village. And I want to say not an ordinary health center. The new wing at the Miku Secondary School in Miku Village. Construction of the new Early Childhood Center in Miku Village. Rehabilitation of the Prale Community Center in Prale. Rehabilitation of the Laundry by the Sea in Miku Village. Infrastructure renovation rehabilitation works on the two laundries, Mang Laundry and Up the Lime Laundry. New home for fishermen at Prale and the storage facilities. What? Construction of a Prale. new road leading to Prale Community Center and Playing Field. Rehabilitation of the Miku Multipurpose Center in Miku Village. Rehabilitation of the Miku Village Council Office in Miku Village. The construction of the new road leading from the Monrepo Highway to the newly merged Monrepo Patients Combined School in Patients. Over 500 school bursary scholarships, etc., to the students in Miku North. The construction of a new uh, Passions Early Childhood Preschool. Construction of a new road in Mayat Gardens, Miku. Mayat, my, my, my apologies. Construction of the two recreational parts. Teacher Johnny's recreational part in Monrepo and children's recreational part in Miku. The new roads in new extension phase one. The pack and captain by the cemetery in Miku. Rehabilitation of the Passions multi-purpose court. And I can go on. Good. So, you want me to go on? No problem. Career and re readiness fair for, this, for the school leavers and young unemployed persons. Installation of two AC units at the Miku Police Station. Annual Dr. Gail Rigobert summer camps. Gail Rigobert netball tournaments. Gail Rigobert football tournaments. Auntie Gail TC Rigobert T20 cricket cup. Demolition and construction of two homes reconstruction of two homes for persons with disabilities in Miku Village. Footpath from pedestrian crossing to Monrepo, Credit Union, and Miku Village. Rehabilitation of Mirage Sachs Preschool in Monrepo. Footpaths in La Pointe. Construction of concrete roads in Lamba and Saint-Marie. 
road rehabilitation near the Malizer residence in Monrepo. Construction of a box drain up in the line Miku near Galaxy Hardware. And I can go on. I have a list of over 60 other projects. That's just in this, and that's just in the last five years term. So to come to this house and to take an incredibly important project, like bringing water to a community, and to continue with the development, and to pretend as if that is the only thing that is, has taken place in Miku North. And to want to convince, maybe yourselves, that the reason why people voted for a labor in the last election is because nothing was happening in Miku? Really? Really? That's for another discussion. That's another discussion. But the reality, it was not from a lack of doing work. It was not an, a lack of, of, of taking up our responsibilities. I'm not even going to get into what we have done in Miku South in terms of roads, water projects, school repairs, fixing up playing fields, healthcare centers. But it never stops. I'm not so sure whether the two hour speech that the Prime Minister gave at his own conference of delegates, I don't know, two hours to convince what? I mean, I was listening to the Prime Minister of Grenada who said, Mr. Speaker, that the Prime Minister spoke for two hours, he spoke for 15 minutes, and people seem to remember what he said in the 15 minutes than what the Prime Minister said in the two hours, right? But there was also another contribution at your conference of delegates by the Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez. The same reason why you watch our stuff. <laughs> so Mr. Speaker, well, all the time, you come here and quote all our stuff all the time. Your Prime Minister, half his, half his presentation yesterday was about what we're doing. But Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister Gonzalez said something that's very, very important. I've said it, but I, don't, I did not ever say it as articulately as he did. Ever. He is very, very good, a genius at that aspect of it. He said, we, we live in a generation of aspiration. That if you are the poorest of the poor, you aspire to be better. If you're middle class, you aspire to be better. And even when you're well off, you aspire to be better. And how I read that, Mr. Speaker, is that politics and economic development is a journey, not a destination. As we build and we, we fix up things, people now accept that they have the water. Tomorrow, it's going to be something else. And that's, and that's the purpose of the democracy that we have, to make sure that nobody ever becomes complacent and that politicians are responding to the aspirations of our people. That's fundamentally what it is. So it's a continuity. We see at UNESCO the success of continuity. It's about coming to this house and saying that we're building on the successes already there and we're going to move at a faster pace. And that by the end of your term, sir, that you're going to have over 60 things in which you can come to this house and highlight that you've done for Miku North. But I would say to you, the persons in Miku South, after electing labor in 1997, have learned their lesson and have no confidence that a labor party is going to do anything for them. An example of the difference is that when we came into office, the member from Denry North and the member from Labry spoke about the Denry Water Project. Very important project. The project never stopped. It continued. And it was delivered. And in fact, the member from Denry was invited. <coughs> cut the ribbon. And spoke. And then when we did phase two, which was not advanced in his administration. We still invited him. And he cut the ribbon again. And we said, it doesn't matter who started the project. If it is a good project. Yeah, I'll get the picture for you. Okay, no problem. 
And he spoke. And he spoke. And he spoke. And he spoke. Huh, doesn't matter. The same, the same CDB that's funding and the and the and the, um, and the Mexicans, and the same persons that are doing La Guerre today. So, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, is that he spoke, and we continued and we continued the project. Very importantly because it was water and it doesn't matter where you come in from St. Lucia and you do not do things to spite an opposition constituency because you also have supporters in that constituency but it's the humanitarian thing to do but Mr. Speaker but Mr. Speaker the, 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 the examples are all there for people to see as to who continues the development of St. Lucia and who stops we, we don't have long, we don't have far back to go. Rodney Bay Road, Mr. Speaker. Can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, the member from Labry spoke about we need to have a debate. And yes, on the Tuesday session, it's, it spoke about the importance of the difference between government and opposition. And when a government minister, particularly a prime minister, is going to get up to speak, he no longer has the right to speak in vague terms. He must speak with accuracy because he has access to the information. Persons on the opposite side are allowed to speculate until it is clarified. And then therefore they should not be able to continue espousing things that have been refuted. Cannot. So the Rodney Bay Road allegations of corruption, all kinds of allegations, most expensive road in St. Lucia, a mile road for 15 million dollars. But when you get down into the debate, Mr. Speaker, and you start unearthing the facts of the, of the thing, it becomes a very different story. I heard the member from Rosalie, four lanes, median, two roundabouts, and a pedestrian walkway and sidewalks. That's what the 15 million dollars for. And not only that, the contract was a fixed contract for $15 million. So even if, even if there was inflation or anything else, they had to complete it for $15 million. $15 million. Yes. If the Prime Minister has anything differently, he will have his opportunity and he can provide the evidence and show otherwise. But I am saying to you, it was a $15 million fixed contract. And this government came in with their own protect the victory mentality that they had to stop the project and cast all kinds of aspersions and at the end of the day the contractor was allowed to stop the project because it had been stopped for more than 90 days that means instead of paying the contractor 15 million dollars they had to assess the works and the works assessment came higher than the 15 million dollars so it means that we're going to have to pay the contractor $15 million for, for a project that he should have completed for $15 million, hasn't, and now you're going to have to find another contractor to finish the works. So at the end of the day, how much is it going to cost? Shock housing, Mr. Speaker, stopped. And if after all the uh, bravado that we're going to go and do this and we're going to go and do that, they cannot move until they settle for the payment of works. Tavern. 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 HIA Airport. Project is stopped. You had a project gone through all its phases. Work had already begun. You stop it. Up to today, you can't tell us when you're going to start, what it's going to look like. Come and tell us some story about you've never been to an airport that has two stories. Really? What, I mean, I, I, honestly, when the Prime Minister travels, I imagine he's traveling. But he, he's not going to, maybe, I don't know. Miami Airport. Pretty much every single airport in the world today has three or four floors. Who cannot understand the concept of separating departure from arrivals? Who, I mean, who really in today's world cannot understand that concept? St. Jude's has been stopped, Mr. Speaker. Want to have a policy debate? Let's have a policy debate about bananas. How is it that a piece of land can be sold for $2.7 million? 
when the same minister in a speech in the groundbreaking um, for a building said that land, oh no, sorry, for the breaking down of the CDC buildings, that it was important because the land is valued at $1,000 a square foot. So land at CDC is $1,000 a square foot. But land on the waterfront at Bonanza is only worth $2.27 uh, a square foot? Really? And there was a valuation that was done in 2013 that showed the land was worth $6.7 I have to go there. Because this, if you want to have a debate, I'm prepared to have the debate on policy and issues. But to come to this house and want to try to fool the people, I mean, I was, I was uh, amazed that when the government came in office in 2000 and, and 2011, the approval for the Japanese to do the Miku North jetty had already been approved. And what did the government do? They moved it to Savans. And so it was our administration who had to wait until we can get Choiselle resolved and some other issues resolved. And it finally got them to build the new berth, the new dock, fisherman's dock in, in Miku village. The design apparently was flawed. <laughs> but the same way, but you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm not embarrassed to say that. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, the entity, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister always speaks about, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to get involved, the other people. The Japanese designed it as a floating, a floating bridge. But you know what? The same Japanese who built Choiseul, how many years it took us to be able to get them to correct the problem there. It happens. But the reality is, is that resources had been made available and a priority was given to do the dock. Unlike a Labour Party who today, Mr. Speaker, wants to come in and to suggest that they, nothing had happened. When they're the ones who moved the jetty. You moved it to, to Savans. The money that was going to go to Miku Village was sent to Savans Bay. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Bhutan. Really? So again, who went and acquired the land to put up the tank? Who put up the tank? Who made all the preparations for the work to be able to bring the water to the people? And you now laid the pipe. I'm, I'm proud of that. That's what we talk about is continuity. But don't come here and tell a half-truth and want to convince people that there is politics involved. Say the truth. Give the people of St. Lucia confidence that the, that the government is functioning. Whatever pecan we want to give each other, that's fine. And as the member from Labry said, we can have a debate on ideological differences. But do not compromise the confidence that people have in our country and that the system does work. Not all the time, not all the time, but some of the times. So if we want to get into debate, let's get into debate about the 2.5% levy. As I said, Prime Minister said repeatedly, the levy is not supposed to affect the price of food. He said it. Don't misquote me. I'm saying it correctly. It's not going on the price of food. Everywhere he went, that's what he said. But today, Mr. Speaker, we see that the 2.5% has impacted the price of food. So turn around and reload. But the inflation was there before. We told you, you cannot increase taxes at a time of inflationary time. And this idea of this tax you have was not going to work. And the thing is, is that, you know, the, the arrogance of the government, that they don't want to listen. And yet they want to turn around, Mr. Speaker, and convince people that somehow they care. Really? You care? You care about the choices that people are having to make every day and have become even harder because of the policies you have? The evidence is there and you still refuse to adjust to it. GPH. I mean, I heard the member again wanting to come back. Really, honestly, FF and F? It is what you were thinking it was what is in your heart. The GPH is a classic example of FF and F. Of course, the, chair, the chairman of Invest is who's good friend. I mean, the member, I hope the prime minister really has sat down and analyzed and questioned whether in fact he's really in control of this government. 
All his friends are in serious positions. All the senior CEOs are, are, are friends. His brother now has been made the permanent secretary of economic development. And then you're turning around on a project that makes no financial sense. You're giving up $400 million of revenue. The question to ask is if GPH goes into bankruptcy, and they can. Last year, GPH lost 57 cents per share. After a hundred and something percent increase in sales this year, it is 41 cents per share loss. $600 million of debt. If they go bankrupt and a receiver is appointed, how is that receiver going to determine, determine the value of the concession that St. Lucia has given him? And it's simple. The member in responsible says he doesn't understand the math. The math is simple. A million passengers over 40 years. I think it's going to be. We had a million passengers in, 1990, in, in 2019. Cruise ship. Cruise. 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 A million. A million. A million. See, he doesn't even know that. Sure, you can have it in your own statistics. You can get this. No, I don't have to. I don't have to. Okay? A million passengers. It's there. Okay, a million by go to the max. Today is 650. What do you think the rate is going to be over a 40 year period? What's the average going to be? If you're going to give the concession for four for 40 years and it's 650 today, do you really believe that the price of 650 is going to remain for the 40 years? I know that when we were in discussions with the cruise lines, they had already agreed to go to $11. So I know that GPH is going to be increasing the price to at least $11, at least. So let's say a million passengers, assuming that we don't grow significantly, and $10, that's $10 million a year times 40 years, 400 million US dollars. The Prime Minister yesterday, Mr. Speaker, gave the information that the cruise is only 11%. Sorry? Tuesday. 11% 11, 11 of the revenue, of the port revenue, who's very clear, careful, port revenue of Slasburg. But the idea is, is what percentage of the profit? Because that cruise business is one of the most profitable arms of Slasburg. So even when you want to take away 11% of the revenue, it is going to have a negative impact on Slaspa. On Slaspa, and the sad part is Slaspa has been running and managing that process. They built and did the extension at Point Seraphin. They have built, developed our cruise ship port. If you go back to 2019 and see the numbers, San Lucia by far was the number one cruise destination in the southern part of the Caribbean. Number one, by far. In terms of numbers, in terms of numbers, go and see it for yourself. You're a, you're a numbers man. Go and see it, Mr. Speaker. So you're going to now give 400 million dollars of revenue if it goes into receivership. How is the receiver now going to value that asset? Because it's not land. What it is is a a, a, a revenue stream guaranteed all the revenue from the cruise ship port in, in St. Lucia is given out in a concession. Take care that St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, doesn't find itself having to go to buy back its own port. Now, if the members on the opposite side really wanted to appreciate it, work out that number, because that is the number that GPA should sell you. So, Mr. Speaker, they want to come and convince us that the great benefit of this deal is that they're going to spend 30 million US. They say 40, but remember, they're also going to take and absorb the debt of Slasco. That's included in the 40. And where is the money going? In the port development. Who benefits from the port development? If the person who is earning all the money on the port, that's who's going to benefit. So they're coming, they're going to use your money, our money, to build up an asset to help them earn more money. That makes sense, Mr. Speaker? We're all supposed to sit here and say that, boy, that's great. That's millions of dollars that they should be spent, given us to buy the concession and let them go. Oh, you see, I love that. And Mr. Speaker, I don't want to uh, uh, take advantage of your generosity. 
But that will be that will be for another day. And I'm very happy to have that discussion, Mr. Speaker, if we want to do an analysis between GPH and Cabot. Oh, today you want to come and talk about passion, but everybody spoke about everything else. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad he's not the speaker. That's what I have to say. So, Mr. Speaker. The administrative building in Viewfort. You know, Mr. Speaker, it would be, it would be, it, it's just comical. When we came into office, Mr. Speaker, their good friend, the contractor, and we're not going to mention names, so we know who we're talking about, was working on the administrative building to find out that NIC, ha the land was never transferred to NIC and there was no planning approval. None. For the administrative building. <laughs> Go and show you didn't have it. You're in, you're in government. You're in government. You have access to all the information. All of it. But you see, Mr. Speaker, they are scared of bringing out the real information because it would show the amount of lies they told when they were in opposition. But you know what? I forgive oppositions. <laughs> okay, because oppositions can say a lot of things. But the reality was is that on many occasions we came here and answered the question, i.e. like CIP. When the member from Cast 3 South continued, it says, oh, the money is not going in. We don't know where the money is. We showed it to him in the, in the, in the, in the budget. He yeah, still wanted to deny. Yeah, he still, we did. Yeah, and he still wanted to deny, and he still wants to deny. Yeah. But he has the information today. Go and produce it. What were the, what, how was the money used? So, Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude that sadly, well, let me first of all say, I'm very happy for the people in Miku North to see the continuation of the work that we have done. This is a very important project, but there's so much more to be done in Miku. And a big part of what needs to be done in Miku is to provide jobs for people. So you went and you demonized DSH, you demonized Ojo Labs, you demonized ITL BPO, you demonized all of those projects, Mr. Speaker. And those are the projects today that are continuing to provide work for the people in the South. And one of the biggest benefits that our government focused on, Mr. Speaker, was the ability that people could not only enjoy water in the South all the time, but they had the opportunity to live in the South and be with their family by providing economic opportunity and prosperity that would not only be as good as the North, but I believe in many ways would have been better. And we already saw the reverse migration taking place, Mr. Speaker. Persons were moving to the south in excitement of what was going to take place. It is only the Labour Party that wants to demonize these things and to destroy progress in this country. And the example, history is replete with examples of that. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that the Prime Minister will prove us wrong. But the reality is your obsession with protecting the victory is hurting this country. And it seems very clearly by your actions and your words that protecting victory is job one, job two, and job three. Stopping HIA is protecting the victory because you don't want to see it come to fruition. Stopping St. Jude's and wanting to move into an old hospital to deny the people the size of a quality, more modern hospital is protecting the victory. Stopping the housing projects throughout the length and breadth of this country is protecting the victory. Stopping the roads in this country is protecting the victory. Wanting to impose a 2.5% tax and selling the assets of this state to foreigners, to foreigners, is protecting the victory. And it's for that reason, Mr. Speaker, that I believe that this government is going to be surprised by the number of persons in this country that share that same sentiment. On the November 30th, November 30th is not about overthrowing the government, it's not about a coup, it's not about violence. It's about exercising democracy, practicing democracy, and to hopefully bring the member from Labry off the rocket he's in and to come back and maybe and drive on the roads of St. Lucia, to drive on the roads of St. Lucia and feel what the people are feeling and to take heed and stop thinking that this 15-2 victory, I notice it's 15-2 and it's not 13-2-2. It's not two two. So again, the people of St. Lucia have listened. 
So all the allegations and the promises that there was no collaboration. It has shown that there was from the beginning. So your government needs to settle down, needs to come back down to some level of reality. And remember ultimately at the end of the day, we all in this room are answerable to the people of this country. And again, continuing projects, improving the infrastructure of constituencies, working for the people of St. Lucia, is what we were asked to do. And therefore, trying to hold yourself on a box as if there's something special that you are doing, you will, you will be sadly disappointed at the results at the next poll. I thank, oh, I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.